talk a little bit about this passage from Mark chapter 1 uh, this morning in the Bible class. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, I'm, I'm reading from the same translation that you just heard uh, Brother Kyle read from. But there are some interesting things about this passage that I think we can uh, learn some valuable lessons from. As there is some, some difference in uh, the text of, of this passage. What, 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 what it should say. Whether it should say moved with compassion or whether it should say becoming angry. Uh, and it was uh, very interesting to, to study that and to, to think about, you know, if, if becoming angry is the correct uh, translation of this or is not, not even really the translation, if, if becoming angry is uh, the more accurate representation of the text itself then, you know, what might we learn from that? And, and uh, again, it, it was an interesting study that I look forward to sharing with you. So the first thing to, to, to answer uh, from the passage is, you know, was it anger or was it compassion? Which, which one of those is the correct reading of the passage? That he was moved with compassion or that he became angry? Well, we just heard read from Mark chapter 1, verses 40 and 41 from the New King James translation, where it says, along with nearly every other translation you will pick up. Uh, I've, I only found one translation that makes the becoming angry the, the reading in the passage. Uh, and so I was curious as to why that is. Why is it that... Uh, the Lexham English Bible, and you've heard me talk about the Lexham English Bible, that, that I uh, enjoy studying from it and, and reading it because of how literal it is. And, and I put a high value on a, a literal translation, right? I, I, I don't want a translator's interpretation of what they think it should say. I want what it actually says. And then let me make up my mind how I take that, you know? I don't want somebody interpreting it for me. I want a translation that I can read what it actually says. And, and we've talked about translations before, how the uh, American Standard Version 1901 uh, is such a, a great translation because it is so literal to the original text. But because it is so literal, it's a little difficult to read. And, and that's the nature of translations. The more literal it is to the original language, the more difficulty there is in reading it in our language smoothly. Right? When, when I was in school and we were graded on translating passages, part of our grade was giving it a smooth read. And that means that you translate it in a way that, that it, it is literal. It does, you know, literally say in English what it says in Greek or Hebrew, uh, but at the same time is easy to read, has a smooth read. And that's more difficult than it might sound, <laughs> because when you're going from one language to another, you can't just do a literal word-for-word -word translation, because... Not everything translates over in, in a, a strictly literal way. Okay, so sometimes there, there is a little element of interpretation that is necessary there to, to give it a, a smooth reading. Okay, but I'm always going to favor the more literal translation. So I have found the Lexham English Bible to be a you know, very good resource. For that, for that reason, it is very literal. So when I saw that the Lexham English Bible had here, instead of moved with compassion, it says here uh, that the leper came to him and asked him, or didn't ask him, made the statement, uh, if you are willing, you are able to make me clean and becoming angry. And that's what's in the handout, as that the handouts are done from the Lexham English translation. 
That's what's in the handout for the harmony this week is that uh, he became angry. And becoming angry, he responded to the leper. And so I saw that and, you know, knowing how literal the Lexham English Bible is, I wanted to know why. And, and in this example, uh, the Lexham English Bible uses good textual criticism. Textual criticism is the science of comparing uh, textual variants and, and determining which one is the more accurate one and going with that one. That, that's what textual criticism actually is and what textual criticism is supposed to do. Okay? The problem is that a lot of people who claim to practice textual criticism, what they actually do is try to explain away things that the Bible says. Well, that's not real textual criticism. Real textual criticism is, is comparing the, the actual text and giving uh, reasons why this one is preferred over that one. And, and if you have a reference Bible, you've got the little footnotes in your reference Bible that, that will tell you, you know, where there was a difference in the, in the uh, uh, text and uh, why this one is used rather than this one. And, and the way that translations do that is on the board of translators, the majority view of the way a passage should be translated goes into the text. But if there is a disagreement amongst the translators, then the uh, disputed translation goes in the footnotes. And so sometimes you get both of those there. Um, well, in, in this instance of translating this becoming angry, we have an example of what I would consider to be good textual criticism. And, and I, I think the uh, New American Commentary sums it up pretty well in, in, in their explanation of it. When they say, uh, why scribes would have changed the latter to the former is easy to see. Now, the latter there is angry. The, the former is compassion. So it's saying there, you know, it's, it's, easy, to, it's easy to understand why scribes, Way back when, when the original manuscript was being uh, copied from, you know, copy to copy to be, to be disseminated, it's easy to understand why some of those scribes might have seen angry there and said, well, that can't be right. That should be compassion. Like these other examples where he was moved with compassion, and so they changed it to compassion. So that, that's what they're talking about there. So why scribes would have changed the latter to the former is easy to see. But that they would have changed the former to the latter is inconceivable. That is, there's, there's no conceivable reason that scribes would have seen in the text there that he was moved with compassion and said, oh, well, that should be angry. <laughs> that should be that he became angry. There's no conceivable reason why they would have done that. So that means that becoming angry is more likely to be the original text and, and the accurate representation of the text. That, that's, that's what that is talking about. So it says, despite the massive external attestation for filled with compassion, internal considerations are so strong that having become angry probably is the original. Furthermore, several other references in Mark refer to Jesus being angry. So it's not, you know, that, that's not something that is unheard of in the Gospels, that you read a passage where Jesus becomes angry. So, you know, those are things that go into determining what is the more accurate representation of the text, which it would seem that becoming angry is the more accurate representation of the text. So it says, furthermore, several other references in Mark refer to Jesus being angry, although they use different words. See Mark 3, 5, Mark 10, 14. Whether Jesus was filled with compassion or moved to anger, he displayed human emotion. And there are many examples of that, and we've talked about that before, that, that Jesus was God in the flesh. He had all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, Colossians 2.9. But he was also a man. We see him becoming hungry. We see him being moved with human emotions and, and, and having emotional responses to things. And so that is definitely something we should take from the text. 
But what about these other examples of where Jesus became angry? <clears throat> For example, in Mark 3, 5, where it says, uh, And when he had looked around at them with anger, this, he's teaching in the synagogue, and something's going on there in the synagogue that caused him to be angry with the audience there. We'll talk more about that in just a little bit. So here's an example of Jesus being angry. He experienced human emotions. Anger is a legitimate human emotion. There are things that should rightfully make us anger. We call that righteous indignation, right? And if there were, if, if there is an example of perfect, righteous indignation, who would it be if not Jesus? Okay, so we have Jesus displaying the emotion of anger, and we get from that an example of when it is right and good to become angry, when it is righteous indignation and not uh, uh, a, a self-willed anger of dominance over another person, which is what anger that leads to violence typically is. Okay, so, so there are examples of Jesus being angry and anger being a good and appropriate response to a situation. And again, we'll come back to that and we'll look at that a little more in just a minute. Then again in Mark chapter 10 and verse 14, here's another example <clears throat> where it says, uh, when Jesus saw it, he was greatly displeased and said to them, that, that greatly displeased translation in the New King James is kind of toning down the actual uh, Greek word that means that he was indignant, right? We, we just talked about righteous indignation. The, the Greek word literally means being indignant or moved with indignation. He, he, he was mad. He got mad. <clears throat> so he was greatly displeased and said to them, let the little children come to me and do not forbid them, for of such is the, the kingdom of God. And so there, there is precedent for it being anger. But then that raises the question, why? why? Why would Jesus have become angry in this situation in Mark chapter 1, verse 40 and 41? What, what is it about that situation that would cause Jesus to become angry? Okay, what if it was anger? And, and does the idea that Jesus became angry fit with the text? Right, because that would also be a consideration whether or not it should be moved with compassion or becoming angry. Well, we can see where moved with compassion would fit because there was somebody there that needed that needed mercy, that needed pity, and Jesus could do something about it. <clears throat> so compassion definitely fits. But what about anger? Right? We're talking about the translation or the text that has becoming angry. Does that fit? And I believe it does. What was it about this situation that would have caused Jesus to be angry, and angry at what? Well, recall what it was that the leper, uh, and if you have the handout, he was a leper, not a leaper. <laughs> right? I, I, I'm going to fix that. Don't worry. <clears throat> so, uh, what was it about this situation with the leper that anger would have been the appropriate response. Because if Jesus became angry, then it was appropriate to do so. Jesus wouldn't have become angry if it were not the appropriate response. Jesus always had the appropriate response, said the right thing, did the right thing. He never made any mistakes, never sinned. He is our high priest without spot, without blemish, the perfect Lamb of God that never sinned. <clears throat> and so... If he did become angry, <clears throat> and that is the correct manuscript for this text, then what would it have been about? And, and over what? Well, remember what it was that the leper said to him when he came to him. What, what did he say? He didn't just come to him and say, Lord, make me well. Lord, I know that you are able to make me well. What did he say? He said, if you are willing. So now here's, here's a leper of all the people in, that were there at that time. Who would, who would have a greater need of compassion, a, a greater need of care 
and somebody to, to care about them. Then a leper who, who had to approach everybody with his hand over his mouth, crying out, unclean, unclean, that everybody would draw back from and would say, uh, no, don't let him come near us. We, we can't get close to him. Who would, who, who would be in greater need than love and compassion than that person? And, and, and yet, here he was coming to Jesus and saying, if you are willing, and it's, you know, it's, it's kind of like a situation, kind of how I imagine it anyway, a situation where somebody comes and, and uh, the very thing that you are known for, that you do, that is your thing, they come to you and they say, you know, well, if you're willing to do that, you can do that. And you look at them and, and you say, what do you mean if I'm willing? That's what I do. <laughs> That's what I'm about. Of course I'm willing. Right? And, and, and so might it be that Jesus became angry at the situation where a leper, someone who should have understood the love and compassion of God's people in his woeful circumstances. Because that's what God's people do. God's people show compassion to those who are in need. God's people show compassion to those who need the gospel. Who are lost in their sins. Who have no hope without Christ. It's God's people that show compassion for them to share the gospel with them. Or those who are destitute, widows and orphans. How many times does the Bible talk about having compassion on those who are destitute, using widows and orphans as the, the standard for them. People who were actually destitute, that needed help, that could not survive on their own, but had to depend on the compassion of other people for them. And yet, here is this person that had never been shown any compassion, was, was uh, doubtful, if you are willing, you can make me well. You can make me clean. If you are willing. Right? He's so doubtful that, that Jesus would even have such compassion for him. And I can see where that would have been upsetting to Jesus. Where that would have, you know, the, the response being something along the lines of, why would you doubt that I would be willing? That's what I'm here to do. And we see indications of that on through the, the uh, passage. And so, you know, in those other examples where Jesus shows anger, or has the emotional response of anger, what was it over in Mark chapter 3 and verse 5 where it says he looked around them with, uh, he, he looked around at them with anger? Why was he angry? Well, there in Mark chapter 3, uh, and, and the, the surrounding passages of verse 5. Let me just start with Mark chapter 3 and verse 1. And he entered the synagogue again, and a man was there who had a withered hand. So there was a handicapped person there in the synagogue. So they watched him closely. They're watching Jesus to see what Jesus is going to do. There's this handicapped person there in the assembly, the person with the withered hand, Somebody who needed compassion. So they watched him closely. That is Jesus, not the man with the withered hand. So they watched him closely, whether he would heal him on the Sabbath, so that they might accuse him. They didn't care about that person. They didn't care about the man with the withered hand. None of them were thinking, this is amazing. This person with the withered hand is here, and Jesus is here, and Jesus can heal his withered hand. This is going to be amazing. Let's watch and see what happens. No, that's not why they were watching. They were watching so that when Jesus healed him, they could say, Aha! You broke the Sabbath. He looked around at them at anger because of their lack of compassion, because of their lack of concern. They didn't care about this person with the withered hand. All they cared about was trying to trap Jesus. And so, yes, he became angry over that, that. That here are these people that are supposed to be God's people. And the Pharisees, the very ones who, who elevated themselves to say, we are the very standard of righteousness, and yet they knew nothing about compassion. 
They knew nothing about the kind of care and love that they were supposed to have been showing this person with the withered hand. All they cared about was trying to trap Jesus and trying to get rid of Jesus. And so, yes, he looked around them with anger. Look at it. Being grieved by what? By the hardness of their hearts. They didn't have compassion. Whereas Jesus was moved with compassion to help people, to do things for people that they could not do for themselves. That's what compassion is. They had hard hearts and did not care. They didn't have compassion. And, and that made Jesus angry. What about Mark chapter 10 and verse 14? What were they doing in Mark chapter 10 and verse 14 that had Jesus greatly displeased or indignant with them. People were bringing their children for Jesus to bless their children, and the disciples were saying, no, no, don't, don't bother him. Don't disturb him. They were restricting access to Jesus. And that made Jesus angry. And he said, let the little children come to me, and do not forbid them, for of such is the kingdom of God. And then he used those children as the, the uh, illustration, as the example for the humility that it takes to uh, be saved. But they were trying to restrict access to Jesus. As though, as though Jesus was like these uh, rabbis of the Pharisees and the Sadducees that, that were elevated, that had their broadened uh, borders of their garment and their big phylacteries that they wore to, to make a show of their righteousness so that uh, other people, when they came to get around them, they would say, no, no, you can't approach the rabbi. He's far too holy to be in your presence. And they were treating Jesus that way, and it, it made him angry. He said, no, don't do that. Do, do not restrict them from coming to me. Don't restrict access. Do, do, do you suppose sometimes that we fail in the area of compassion? And in our failure to show compassion, to show the love and mercy that Christ exemplified, that we restrict access to Jesus, that we stop people from seeing Jesus for who and what he actually is. I can see where that would make him angry. And so, yes, anger, anger fits. So uh, we can see anger being demonstrated throughout this context. Prior to this, Mark records Jesus teaching in the synagogues, healing and casting out demons, and uh, how they were uh, watching and, and being attracted to that. Immediately following this is the, the account of the paralytic paralytic being healed. And, and what does it say there uh, in Mark chapter 2, verses 5 through 8? Jesus saw their faith. He said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven you. We're going to talk more about that this evening in a lesson, whatever it takes. He says, Son, your sins are forgiven you. And some of the scribes were sitting there and reasoning in their hearts. Why does this man speak blasphemies like this? So, Rather than having the response, praise God, the Messiah is here and he's forgiving sin. They reason in their hearts, this man's blaspheming. He's a blasphemer. And so Jesus says, uh, why do you reason about these things in your hearts? Then right after this, in Mark chapter 2, verses 16 and following, is the feast at Levi's house. And what did they do? When they saw Jesus eating at Levi's house with the tax collectors and the sinners, they said, oh, well, what kind of rabbi is he? He eating with tax collectors and sinners. And Jesus gave that, that uh, great physician passage that he didn't come for those who were not sick. Those who are well have no need of a physician. But those who are sick, I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. To repentance. See, Jesus came to be compassionate to those who needed him. Uh, these people that, that thought that they were the very standard of righteousness, that they were above reproach, they didn't care about other people. They didn't have compassion. And when Jesus showed the compassion of God to people, what did they do? They accused him and they, they reviled him and they uh, we're envious of him. And so, yeah, it, it made him angry. 
He, he became angry over those things. So it may be that the leper's doubt of Jesus' willingness to heal him was upsetting to Jesus because of what it said about the scribes and the Pharisees and how this poor leper had never been shown compassion and, and was, almost, was almost fearful in his approach to Jesus. Like, if you are willing, you can make me clean. And so, I don't believe that Jesus was angry at the leper. Jesus was angry just like he was in the other examples. He was angry at the hard-heartedness of the people that the leper had had to deal with up to that point. And that hardness of heart, that lack of compassion, that, that restricting access to the love and mercy of God made him angry. Right? That's what we see in those other examples of the, the, the healing in the synagogue. He was angry with them because of the hardness of their hearts, it says. And in Mark chapter 10, verses 13 to 16, he was angry with them because they were trying to restrict access to him. They were treating him like these other prideful rabbis. And that, that made him angry. And so, hardness of heart, no compassion. And he became angry about that. Restricting access, no compassion. And he became angry about that. Corruption, right? There's, there's that account of the cleansing of the temple that we talked about in John chapter 2, verse 13 to 17, where he goes, he goes to the temple and he sees there how people were corrupting the, the worship of God, how people were corrupting the sacrifices that were made to God, making it a, a means of profit. And what did he do? He made a he made a, a whip of cords and ran them all out, flipped over tables, and uh, it was eat up with zeal for his father's house. It says it doesn't explicitly say he was angry, but I think if I walked over here and I kicked over a pew and I picked up a book and started swatting at y'all, saying "Get out of here," <laughs> you'd probably say, "Norm's mad." <laughs> right? So I I think he pretty clearly demonstrated he was angry over what was being done in the temple. And so, corruption, no compassion. And it made him angry. Well, uh, we, can, we can see the, the connection there between his anger and compassion. What was it that made him angry? It was the lack of compassion present in those who should have known better. Just like, just like the, the uh, Good Samaritan. When we see in Luke chapter, I'm going to jump ahead, in Luke chapter 10 and verse 33, with the good Samaritan uh, that, that came and showed compassion to the Jew that had been mugged and left bleeding on the side of the road. What did he do for him? He took care of him in the way that he needed to be taken care of that a, 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 a priest and a Levite didn't even do. And here's a Samaritan come along showing the compassion that God's people were supposed to have shown. In Luke chapter 15 and verse 20, it says, And he arose and came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. Talking about the father of the prodigal son, responding to his son coming back. And he was moved with compassion and immediately took his son back in, showed him the love and the mercy that he needed. He took him back in and and. The parable is really about the older brother. Because then the older brother's mad. The older brother gets mad that his younger brother was shown compassion by the father. And the father has to tell him, isn't it right that we should make merry over your brother's being restored? See, that parable is about the hard-heartedness of the Jews at that time. And it made Jesus angry. When, when we see people hindered, in their response to the gospel because of the uh, lack of concern, lack of compassion, lukewarmness, indifference to what it means to be a child of God, that, that, that should make us angry. And I think we have a great example here of a lesson that, that we should take to heart. We should care. We should have a great deal of concern over 
God's compassion being demonstrated by his people. And when that doesn't happen, yes, we, we should get angry about that. Or, or uh, access to Jesus being restricted because the, the lifestyle and the, the words and the deeds of, of God's people don't match what the gospel says they're supposed to be. So that, so that people, even when they do hear from us the gospel of Christ, and, and uh, they're, they're given the information to believe and to repent of their sins and to confess that they believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God so that they know what it says about being baptized into Christ for the remission of sins. The example they see in our lives is such that they say, yeah, but I don't, you know, he doesn't really mean it. Well, yeah, that should make us angry because that hinders access to Christ. When we see the kind of corruption in the worship of God today, that Jesus dealt with in the temple when he cleansed the temple, we should be eaten up with zeal for our Father's house. That should move us to indignation. So, yes, anger was a response that does fit with what was going on. Do you get angry over these things, over the lack of compassion, the, the, the lack of access to Jesus, because the people who should be opening that access don't do it? Well, you should. And if you need to respond to the gospel's call this morning, we want you to know that uh, we do have that loving compassion to see you be brought into Christ for the, for the remission of your sins. We do care about you. And we want to all work together to be the people that God would have us to be so that Jesus never has a reason to become angry with us. Whatever your need is this morning, pray that you'll come, Lord, stand and stand.